sound of German aircraft filled the skies over the Channel Islands. They're followed by the whistle of bombs and the crack of explosions. The islands have been demilitarised, but a row of trucks and the key of St Peterport's harbour were mistaken for military vehicles, bombed and destroyed. Red liquid spilled from them, their cargo of tomatoes symbolic of the 34 civilians killed in the attack. Welcome to... The curiosity of... A Child. The bombing raid commenced at 6.45 and lasted nearly an hour with locals unable to put up any resistance. The Weybridge clock damaged by the bombing stopped just before 7 o'clock, marking its moment in time. Two days later, German officers arrived on the island to accept their surrender. Following the terms of the Geneva Convention, the islanders responded to invasion by offering no resistance, but also no collaboration. The Germans set up a controlling committee to run the island, taking over from the local government, the states of Guernsey. Jersey, Audenay and the rest of the Channel Islands also fell under German occupation for the next five years. They were also the only part of the British Isles uh, to be occupied by the Germans during World War II. So photos of Nazi troops marching through St Peterport were popular propaganda tools. That's right, and we've got a couple of the photos here, haven't we? Mm -hmm. um, so this is the High Street in Guernsey, and there's a whole bunch of German soldiers walking up. What do you yeah. notice about it, though? It looks like... Um, a long robot <laughs> marching and oh this one's different this is a uh, kind of a band yeah. with lots and lots of sneaking soldiers as yeah, well yes a long line of them yeah but if you notice both in their their bands aren't they in both yeah. of those so i find it a bit funny how you go and occupy <laughs> and then you another play place. free music <laughs> yeah yeah and then you put on a concert for them yeah um so it's odd tool how music is kind of another tool of propaganda i guess isn't yeah. it to remember this event, we visited where the worst of the bombing occurred. It's now marked by several plaques telling the story of the evacuation and those who lost their lives that day. Mm -hmm. So we now go over to our live recording. Yeah. We're down in St Peterport now by the White Rock where the bombing happened 80 years ago to this very day. Yeah. We're standing opposite the White Rock Cafe now and you might hear a flagpole clattering in the wind, it's very windy, which is where the bombings took place. So there would have been all the tomato trucks lined up along here, Anton. So could you imagine what it must have been like, kind of um, a few weeks earlier, people have evacuated off the island, and then you hear up in the sky the sound of aircraft. Um, if you were a child, you'd probably be a little bit confused. Um, if you were uh, older, terrified. Yeah, it's, it's a little island and we, I think we felt a little bit out of the way and kind of um, non-threatening to anybody to actually then become involved in the war, I think was a shock to yeah. many people. Now, um, just days before the occupation, plans were hastily put into place to evacuate the islanders. With limited time to make arrangements, the communication was confusing and misinterpreted at times. Despite this, 5,000 schoolchildren and 12,000 adults were evacuated to the UK, but not all those who wanted to leave were able to. Um, I know you've been doing some of this at school, haven't you? A little history? bit. So could you imagine what it'd be like well, being your age and leaving the island? I guess it would be quite exciting because you might not have gone on a boat before, um, but also a little bit scary and upsetting because you're leaving your island somewhere where you don't know. and um, Yeah, and there's the war on as well. Yeah. Whilst it hasn't really come to the island yet. Yeah. You know that you're probably... Um, heard in, or seen in the papers of England's being bombed and you'd be thinking are you going to where it's going to be bombed and yeah. obviously you're not being taken there you're going out, being taken out into the countryside or further north by great ramps who went up to Scotland yeah
Now where we are, there's actually lots of various plaques up on the walls, aren't there? Uh, commemorating different um, events that happened during the war. So there's one here, which Santon's going to read in a moment. This plaque commemorates the evacuation of children and adults ahead of the occupation of the island by Germany forces in June 1940. Four fifths of the children and um, altogether almost half the population of Guernsey were transported to England. So that scarcely a family was, what does that say? Undivided. Undivided, because it's quite tricky to read this. Yeah, I think they need to. Uh... Do it again. Yeah, let's just clean up the plaque a little bit. Yeah. Now there's some other ones here. Yeah. Here's a commemoration to some Jews in the island who were yeah. sadly. Uh, died at Auschwitz. And there's another memorial here. It's dedicated to the memory of all the islanders who committed acts of protest, defiance and resistance during the German occupation. Those who were imprisoned or deported and those who died in captivity. So there's uh, seven people listed here, aren't they? And somebody's left a flower next to it, so maybe a relative. So this plaque uh, commemorates the illegal deportation of uh, by Germany occupying forces of 1,003 men, women and children from Guernsey and Sark in September 1942 and February 1943 um, to captivity in civilian internment camps in Germany and France. Actually, they probably might have gone to Biberach, uh, which is in the south yeah. of Germany. So we are at another tablet um, which was erected to the to the memory and, and it records the names of those members of the civil population who lost their lives as the result of an enemy air raid. So there's 34 of them. Um, yes, yeah, so it names all 34 people who yeah. were um, killed in the bombing 80 years ago. We're also lucky to have recordings of people's memories from that day, people who actually witnessed the event, and we'll play part of some of them now. The full video will be linked on our Twitter and also on our website. We heard these aircraft coming over. I could see them. There were nine of them in formation. And uh, I said, oh, well, there they are, lad. And all of a sudden, there was ladders going down from them. I said, Dad, why are they putting ladders down from the planes? And, he said, oh, my God, we got, he yelled to my mum, we've got to go. We've got to go and find shelter. Why? Those aren't ladders, those are the bombs starting to come down. Anyway, we, we quickly went to the, um, the toilet block there um, because um, it was sandbagged for the war, and then the first bomb actually exploded somewhere. <laughs> and I'll tell you, we didn't take many seconds to get into the... And because we didn't go around the back to the gentry, gentry, everyone was going into the first bit they could get into. And we went into the ladies' toilet block, and uh, there we stayed for the, for the whole of the raid um, because we had no other alternatives. The old men knew the bomb made a whistling noise when they came, and someone said, Crikey, Eric, this is going to be a close one. We were, we were whistling down. A hell of a bang. Anyway, the raid ended. That was a lot. It must have been about the last stick of bombs that fell. And anyway, when, we, when this all clear went, about perhaps 10 minutes later, we could see it had landed. Well, what was the income tax office now? It wasn't the income tax office there, but it was a, a, a tobacco factory, and it was on fire. It had landed that close. It was frightening for me because being a, a little lad, I didn't know what was going on and all this noise and then having to be told to squat down and be quiet it was very frightening, yes. The Germans expecting swift victory against the British experimented with a gentler approach to the occupation than in other parts of Europe. I imagine this was helped by the island's geography. Small and cut off from the mainland, Europe, they posed less of a threat. The slower island life maybe also had a calming effect. 
And we've also got some newspapers here from the period, so let's have a quick look at the front pages, shall we? Yeah. So this is the Star, which is dated July the 3rd, 1940, so a couple of days later. And then there's the Orders of the Commandant of German Forces in the Occupation of the Bailiwick of Guernsey. And there's a list of regulations and things which they um, have to follow there, or the locals have to follow. So all clocks and watches are to be advanced yeah. by one hour from midnight to bring it in accordance with the German time. And assemblies at churches and chapels for the purpose of divine worship are permitted. Um, so, yeah, there's de the new rules. That but there's also still some adverts running in the paper. Yeah. So we've got Swelling the Fruit from W. Holmes and Son Limited. There's also another advert for Poplar Tobacco, the Stuart Mixture. And there's an, another headline on the front page, which is States. So that's the local government here. States ready to take over last from growers. Complete break with the past. There's also some notices here. So to every islander. Uh, the public are notified that no resistance whatsoever is to be offered to those in military occupation of this island. The public are asked to be calm, to carry on their lives and to work in the usual way and to obey the orders of the German commandant. So it's a bit of a mixture there, isn't it, between yeah. half normal life and... Uh, strict rules. Strict rules, yeah. And we've got another one here actually from June the 29th. And uh, these are the... Headlines after the um, bombing itself. So, you've got 22 dead and 33 badly wounded in last night's raid. So, uh, sadly, some more people kind of died after that as well. Dreadful toll of German bombs and machine guns. Popular police constable among the killed. And uh, this was a bit shocking. Ambulance attacked while taking victims to hospital. So we will put these newspapers as well. We'll link to them from our Twitter and yeah, our website. It's a little bit hard to read, but um, mm -hmm. I'm sure you can find a way. <laughs> Despite the gentler approach to the occupation and locals trying to live a normal life, it wasn't easy going. This same geography that may have led to quieter times <laughs> would prove a problem later in the war. The islands remained under German occupation as the Allies started to take control of much of Europe, meaning limited food and supplies could reach the islands, leading to the near starvation in winter of 1944-45. Hostilities will end officially at one minute after midnight tonight, Tuesday the 8th of May. But in the interests of saving lives, the ceasefire began yesterday to be sounded all along the front. And uh, our dear Channel Islands are also to be freed today. It wasn't until May 9th, 1945, that the islands were fully, uh, finally liberated. But that's not to say that the Germans didn't take the occupation seriously. On 10th of October 1941, Hitler announced his intention to convert them into an impregnable fortress! <laughs> I had to do that. <laughs> A series of bunkers and fortifications were built, circumvalenting the islands, many of which still remain to this day. Over 300 structures were built throughout the Channel Islands, making them some of the most heavily fortified outposts in Europe. So Guernsey is like the super mega ultra easy defending thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> this mass building surely outweighed the actual need, but thankfully they were never used in anger. The largest structure built was the underground hospital in Guernsey, which covers 7,000 square metres, much of it dug out of the rock by slave labour. And you're not much of a fan of it, are you? It's an eerie place to go, isn't it? I haven't it? been there for a while, but yeah, it's a little bit creepy because the lights are green. And it's just a bit. It smells odd as well, green. doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I haven't been there. Although I do like the gift shop. Well, we'll go for the gift shop then, shall we? Yeah. <laughs> Many parts of the island became no go areas for civilians. They're covered in barbed wire, and some 67,000 mines were buried on the beaches and cliffs. Occasionally, they're still found today. Mm. I remember a story um, of we had someone into school telling us about their. Um, time during the occupation mm -hmm. and they'll go down to the beach because they live quite near the beach digging up mines and telling um 
and bringing them to their parents and saying, yeah. look what you found. <laughs> like, loads of them were there. The and they were like, terrifying. you shouldn't be doing that. But they, <laughs> they did it anyway. And yeah. none of them excluded. There was like, she said that she had about 50 of them or something. Blimey. Not one of them blew up. It's amazing, actually, how well they've been cleared. Because kind of in my lifetime, I don't really remember much. Yeah, 67,000 yeah. cleared in. <laughs> yeah, so you get stories of lots of places in the world where mines have been placed and like years and years and years later, there's still no-go areas. So it's fantastic, yeah. actually, how well cleared it has been. And we really need it, because an island... <laughs> what's an island without beaches? <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, the Germans also deployed 12,000 troops to Guernsey. That's one soldier for every two civilians, so life was anything but normal. For comparison, in France, there's only one soldier for every 80 people. Yeah. <laughs> then I've got a map of the fortifications here, Anton. Um, and you can see how they really surround the island, don't they? So yeah, they're everywhere. Some of them are kind of in groups, so you must think, like... Almost flanking fire if the enemies were to come from that direction. Yeah, be strategic points. Yeah. Um, which they need to supply. So these red ones here on the island in the middle, we'll try and put this map on our Twitter. Those are some large kind of guns. And the ones that we visited, which we'll talk about in the moment, mm -hmm. that's actually a small gun. Even that's quite big. Well, um, yeah. none on Liu Island, though. Today, as well as reminding us of the history, the bunkers also make great places to visit. And a couple of weeks ago, Anton and I visited one of the gun emplacements in the southwest of the island. The HKB General Oberst Dolman Battery is situated at Plymouth. Sitting high on the cliffs, overlooking the sea, surrounded by trenches and near several observation towers, it would have been an important strategic... <laughs> strategic? <laughs> I can't see that word today. It's okay. It would have been an important strategic <laughs> um, position to defend against naval invasions. Yeah, and I actually think that um, this battery was named after a German general, Frederick Dolman, which we're probably pronouncing wrong there. Um, yeah. he... Frederick Dolman. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, and he was um, he commanded the Seventh Army during the invasion of France, and was also um, leading up part of the invasion of Normandy. To was killed in 1944, I think. Uh, so pop a picture of him in the show notes. He's got about as much hair as I do. Maybe a bit more. Perhaps a bit more, actually. Yeah. The battery was armed with four 22 centimeter guns one of which has been restored and can be visited today. Yeah, that was actually from Jersey, that gun. I think it was at the bottom of some cliffs and they found it <laughs> nice. half buried and brought it over here. Ah, uh, that must have been a tricky job to bring it over here firstly and secondly restore it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was really fun because we climbed all over the um, gun. <laughs> it was yeah. cool. Yeah. Pretending to actually use it and load it, turn it around and everything. The guns were actually captured French cannons um, from World War One with a range of 22 kilometres. So they were FT7, Renault FT17s, um, most of the machine gun ones, I'm pretty sure. Those are separate, yeah. So yeah. that was, yeah, they, they, that big cannon wasn't, that was a no, no, that was, field artillery. Yeah, that was artillery, not a yeah. puny um, turret. So that was um, a turret from a little French tank, wasn't it? Yeah, FT17, it was tiny, not much bigger than a car. And so what did they do with it? They took the turret off and plonked it in a hole in the ground so you could <laughs> get into it. Yeah, like a little armoured turret. Oh, I remember um, going to a club mm. and we went around here and it, there was a puddle going into the entrance. So, so someone who was like really or oh, army or oh, awesome, um, they just dived into the puddle, crawled up. And <laughs> like a leopard crawl. <laughs> yeah, and the... Little doors around the back were closed. So he opened and it was like, boom. Oh, so he climbed into the turret then? Yeah. <laughs> cool. It was really funny. The bunker was also defended by 10.5 centimetre field guns, mortars and machine guns, searchlights and minefields. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> pretty heavily militarised area, wasn't it? Yeah, I think they quite liked that area. We will have some photos on Twitter and um, the website, which should be coming soonish. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Depends when you're listening to this. That is true. Maybe it's launched already and got a million yeah. visits. 
There are also two large ammunition bunkers dug deep into the ground, which can still be entered, and we have a short recording from one now. Okay, so what's behind this big rusty door? Uh, pitch black room. Let's go in. Okay, it's terrifying. Yeah, it's very, very dark in here. You can't really see the floor. The acoustics are amazing again. So, Anton, do you know what was there? Yeah, they use this room for ammunition. It's also very scary. Yes, it's kind of deep underground, this bit, isn't it? So you could imagine it being um, well protected from enemy yeah. shells and shelling. And they use really thick doors as well. I can't remember what they, um, they're made of to protect their stuff. Yeah, it looks iron or something. I don't know, it's definitely metal. Then there's a window here where they would be able to pass out the shells more easier, I imagine. Yeah. And there's a couple of these rooms, aren't there? <laughs> Do you want to get out of here now? Yeah. <laughs> It was dark in that bunker, wasn't it? Very dark. Yeah, amazing acoustics. I remember acoustics. we we went uh, just as we were going out. There was a giant spider, we think, on the wall. Oh yeah, yeah. It looked like it was like three times the size of a tarantula. <laughs> it's well worth a visit, though, even if you are scared yeah. of spiders. Now we've got some interesting statistics here about the fortification of the islands, haven't we? So some of these numbers are amazing. When you've got to remember just how small. Guernsey is, and that was off the coast of France. It wasn't part of the mainland. You wouldn't call it particularly strategically important. The airport's not that big to be able to have it as some sort of... Big, um... Important aerial place to control these skies. Yeah, because you can't really, um... They would have to send planes from France, probably, if they wanted to go to England, because they couldn't have any giant Yeah, or, or just planes. getting fuel onto the island and things for them. And food. And food, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, these numbers are amazing, when you consider yeah. all of that. So... Number one, <laughs> over 16,000 military engineers and workers were brought to the Channel Islands for the building projects. Two, 244,000 square metres of rock were excavated during building. The rest of the Atlantic Wall only totaled 255,000 square metres. Yeah, so just in... The islands alone, there was nearly as much stuff dug out as in the rest of the Atlantic Wall, which would have been um, kind of down the edge of France and things. Yeah. <laughs> a much larger area. Three. Over half a million square metres of concrete were used in Guernsey. It's a lot of bunkers. <laughs> yeah. Four. There were 118 minefields laid on Guernsey each containing countless mines. Yeah, so there must have been so many places where you couldn't go. So it's just amazing, actually. Thank you to everybody who cleared those up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so the, the bunks are good places to visit, aren't they? Yeah. Guernsey and the other Channel Islands may have avoided the worst of World War II, but the invasion and the five-year occupation have left their mark. The sheer number of fortifications makes you wonder about Hitler's long-term plans for the islands. Today, however, they offer fantastic places to visit, adding to our history and keeping these important memories alive. Living in such a small community, it's easy to forget we're part of a larger world and we're not always shielded from events. The lights of coronavirus have reminded us of this and that we're one large global community and we should all strive to be good, responsible people. Whilst recording in town about the tomato bombings, Anton and I chatted to a man who was curious about what we were doing with a microphone. He was a former politician from South Africa and interested in the history we were telling. Like the events we have told, he too has seen great changes and struggles in his lifetime. But with them, he's been wise and knows that it's what's inside each one of us is that matters. The person we are and who we want to be. And that is why we need to remember our history and learn from it. That's a wrap in another show. Yeah. <laughs> Just a single feature this time because it's such an important yeah, event. I guess it would be like a Guernsey occupation special. So I hope you enjoyed it. And make sure you follow us on Twitter at... The Curie Child Pod. No, just Curie Child Pod. No, there. Oh. Curie Child Pod. That's right, Curie Child Pod. <laughs> please, please, please leave a review as well. And we'll try and get some photos up on our Twitter and hopefully a website live soon, as I have started it. Yeah. So goodbye and thank you. See you next time. Bye. Yes. Bye. Sonia, Sherry, Gem of the 
And uh, our dear Channel Islands are also to be free today. Forget. 